Hello, everybody. I'm pretending to be Chad today. I got a thumbs up. Awesome. My name is McKenna. I am Chad's integrator. And I actually just got off the phone with Chad because he is currently driving and some unexpected things came forward. And so he's unable to make it very last minute. He just called me about it. Does anybody have any questions to start off with? Any discussion topics? Yeah, yeah, I got a course. I just finished my course here about, about a week ago. And I was all uh, wondering when I received like a probate certification inside the uh, mail. That's a great question. So um, right now, today, we are going to be transitioning all of our alumni into a new platform called Kajabi. And within that, we can offer certificates. So up until this point, we had a couple different platforms. And unfortunately, we were not able to send certificates through them. And so we just upgraded into a brand new platform. All of you will be receiving an email here probably today with your new login credentials. And then what you can do is um, just re-quiz yourself and then you'll have access for your certificate that you can edit and it's also printable for you as well. No, I appreciate it. Anything else? It can be probate related and maybe all of us can work together to to brainstorm some solutions. Yeah, I've got a question. I've been doing mailings now for about three months and I do a front that the percentage of a return on that would be minimal, but it's, it's been even lower than what I expected. So I would love to hear if there's anybody in the group today that's been marketing to attorneys, you know, how that's gone for them. What was the best approach? You know, kind of like good stuff to know, bad stuff to know. I don't know if Kat has videos that she can recommend to us, but I would love to throw that one out because the videos, even though I do up front, it takes time. It's like planting a crop. I expected better and I, I've been kind of disappointed. So I've got to take a more proactive direct route, and maybe go to a better source. So if anybody's got any feedback or input, I would love to hear it. Or if Kat has videos she can recommend to us. I would really love that as well. So I'll make sure I drop a bunch of resources in the show notes, but did you see the most recent Ask the Expert video with Rylas Dana? No. Oh. You know, Rylas Dana not only is a probate attorney in two different states, but he's also an estate planning attorney. So just like you want probate attorneys to be able to work with you to bring you referrals, he also understands that a smart, skilled real estate practitioner that knows what they're doing when they come across a distressed property situation or a situation where, you know, maybe a financial plan isn't in place. He understands the value you can bring not to his clients alone, but also how you can help him build and scale his legal business. That interview, it's, it's 50 minutes. It dropped a ton of gems and it really will give you better understanding of your USP, what you should be saying when you reach out to attorneys, how you can actually be the real estate practitioner they want to work with, even if they've already got two other realtors on their bench. If that's to me, that would be hitting a home run here. So we can get that. That would be great. I don't know if there's other recent interviews with other attorneys. We've got a nice to blend in maybe some more feedback, but I would love that. So thank you. Yeah, it was mentioned uh, in previous shows that, um, you know, one way to attract business with attorneys is to go ahead and bring them business. And so when it comes to probate, it takes time for them to get paid. However, you could always bring someone that needs a will or a living trust put together, some kind of estate plan. But recently, I referred four people to attorneys. So we'll see how that works out, but that's a good way to kind of get your foot in the door because I only really have a handful of attorneys that I'm talking with right now. And so... I'm just trying to get my foot in the door that way. I know Bill Gross is really huge on just going after attorneys and that's who he deals with primarily. And I think that's a good way to go because you got to think of it like, like, like they're the bank, so to speak. Like if you go to a bank for, with listings, they can hand you like a whole ton that are in foreclosure or pre foreclosure or yeah, foreclosure. And with attorneys, you know, they might be having several attorneys that are handling different estates. So once you can get in front of them and make a good presentation to them, then they're more than likely to go ahead and recommend you to their client. So they could hand you one property to sell. They can hand you 10, you know. Bruce, with your experience, are you getting these leads by just cold calling and your mailers or how are you, are you generating the leads here for the attorneys? Okay. So the attorneys, I basically have looked at uh, those that have been filing probates, uh, some that are busy, some that are not so busy. For instance, the other day I had to find somebody who spoke Spanish and focused in on probate. 
we don't have that <laughs> here. So it was a challenge, but I just, just found, found that person. Sounds like he's a really good guy to work with. Uh, I'll be able to refer more business to him as well. Not only Spanish, but English, because I want someone that I can go to and say, Hey, look, you can get a initial free consultation with this attorney here and go ahead and talk with them and set up an opportunity to go over your estate plan. And it's amazing how many people that I talk to, they just do not have it together when it comes to like having a will or having a living trust. They don't have it together. A lot of people, they have properties and they don't have uh, anything in plan. They, they might have kids. Someone I was talking to today, I said, Hey, listen, you know, you've got kids, you have a business and you know, you've got some land. It's like, now what happens if you happen to, to die or what's going to happen to your kids? You know, what's going to happen to your business? What's going to happen to that property that you own? So I, I ended up referring them to an attorney. And so, you know, they really thank me for it because a lot of people just don't want to plan for this. And if you're in this Spanish speaking field, uh, it's very, it's a very under, underserved area in regards to probate. Got it. Going back to, to the question, uh, or actually the statement you made, you just gave four referrals to two attorneys. What I was curious about, are you actually working a list and you're calling these or you're mailing, you're getting a response there once you make your initial contact? Is that how you're getting the leads from these guys? Yeah. So basically with the attorneys, I'm just basically calling them. And then also, uh, I'm going to do what Chad said and just try to go face to face, just kind of walk in a, on their office and say, hi, you know, I'm Bruce. I'm, you know, here's what I do, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, just want to get an opportunity to meet with the attorney if, if possible. Because sometimes you have the gatekeeper and the gatekeeper won't let you get in the door there, you know, pass you know, like on the phone, right? In person, it might be a different story. Thanks, Bruce. I also wanted to add, and I dropped the links in the chat on the side, they'll also be in the show notes, but we also did an interview with Laurel Starks. In that interview, she really digs into how the divorce niche found her and how a divorce attorney called her up and said, I have this client that needs help getting her to this property. And she kind of stumbled through all of the specific needs that a divorce client might have. You know, divorces can commonly involve restraining orders, urgent need for relocation, incarceration, complicated situations, not that different from what you might see in a probate case. Um, so that's another one that you should really direct your attention to, even if you're not wanting to approach divorce leads per se, you know, just underscoring that approach, knowing how to react with confidence when a prospect introduces a tricky situation your way, and then knowing how to present yourself in front of an attorney with that same confidence that, hey, whatever you've heard from your clients, I've heard it all too, and I'm, I'm able to come up with a solution. This is what we do. So I would definitely recommend that even though it is divorce rather than probate, there's a lot of similarities. Thank you, Kat. And thank you, Bruce. I have something to add. This is Gio in San Diego. Uh, one of the approaches that I've taken is, you know, we're looking to get networked with uh, probate attorneys. And how many of us know real estate attorneys or family attorneys or, you know, just another attorney that could be either a resource or a friend? And I've gotten referrals to probate attorneys through these other attorneys. And one of the things that I'm looking to start doing is networking with CPAs. Uh, obviously it's a busy time for your normal CPAs, but business CPAs, anybody that's, I would say more than a, a rookie in the business that, that has connections with these other attorneys, specifically probate or estate planning attorney. And, uh, I think that would be a good approach to, to get to know. We'll just say the, the folks out there that if they think about you and they know what you do, you might just get a, a referral. But at the same time, when you get a referral, guess what the first thing they do is they check out who we are, right? And so that's the part that I really need to work on is uh, getting my presence, getting my Google business page going, kind of get all angles covered so that when I do have an opportunity, it's not wasted. Any thoughts uh, on who's put a little business page together? Yeah, Winston. I can tell you what I did, Gio, and they basically call it a credibility website. And I think that's probably a pretty good description. And everybody pretty much knows here that Chad helped build ATL, all the leads. They offer uh, a web building service. And it's actually, for what you get, I think priced very well. It's like a couple hundred bucks and there's like 30 some odd bucks a month just to carry it and service it. But they put something together for me that has been very handy. And I've shown it to a couple other attorneys 
And they felt it was done very well. So for a few hundred bucks, a little like 30 something, it's maybe it's 39 bucks a month to, to keep it open and active and serviced. You might want to give ATL a call. Yeah, great. I do have the template and I, I got Fiverr to customize it to myself. So is that what you're referring to Winston? That, that similar? Then, I'll just go ahead and share with you guys. And you want to go to www capital OC, capital P for probate solutions.com. Check it out. And they can do things to individually customize it for you too, as well. So it's, it's kind of a work in motion and I felt their quality and their service and their timing, the pricing to be very good. Great. Thanks for I'll take a look at it. The other, the other idea I had, and this is before I actually did my first probate listing is I, I got a lead. I did not know how to deal with probate. Obviously, you know, your first one, you're kind of trying to figure it out. But what I did was I did a probate search for agents that knew probate. And I called the gal who supposedly was a probate agent, but she just did a, an SEO. She built her website. So it, it had her as one of the top area probate experts. But when I called her, cause I was in, intent on potentially referring the business to her because I didn't have that much uh, experience in it. And, but I found out that you know, she was a, for a better word, a pretender. So my point is we can build a presence and credibility and validity for other agents to find us and say, they refer business to us. I don't know if that, what are your thoughts on that being an angle to get, you know, leads from folks, especially new folks that a new agent that may be lost in, Hey, what do I do here? And, uh, you know, we put ourselves out there as the, the CPA, the probate expert and, and we'll pay a referral. Are you guys, has anybody had that happen to you? That's a great idea it's, and I haven't done it yet, but it's a great idea. I do a lot of referrals for traditional real estate. It's a great idea. I've been getting out the word to folks in my area that I'm a probate realtor and basically asking them, Hey, have you thought about getting into it? And almost everybody agent wise I've talked to really hasn't thought about it. And then you, of course you ask the second question, why? And it's fear. It's fear that, uh, oh, there's too much word. Uh, I don't like to deal with scenarios like that. So I think that's an opportunity for us to, to utilize that fear again, to get a simple referral, paying out 20, 25% to an agent and they gladly turn it over. If, if we can handle that process and, you know, even if it takes a year, you know, that's what we do is we help not only the uh, folks that are in probate, but agents that come across it, that honestly can botch a whole, I've, I've had some agents that have signed listing agreements that are not valid and at listing percentages that aren't approved. So it's, it just goes to show you that uh, we can help more than just the uh, personal representatives and executors of these estates. I'm not in a huge market. But I noticed that there was not a probate attorney that was dominating the space on the list. But a lot of the attorneys that do probate work, uh, a lot of times their spouses are agents. So what I've started on my team, I've started going out and recruiting those agents. A lot of times, at least over here, their agents don't like probate because they don't understand the process. So I've made it clear, hey, send me what you've got. I'll throw your referral fee to it. And I'll handle all the headache. A lot of them are scared of confrontation between yep. family members and things like that. So, you know, it, it's not about confrontation when you've got a system in place. So, um, that's been the thing, but the best tool I've had to get in front of attorneys or to get recommended is not actually through the attorneys themselves. It's actually through investment advisors and CPAs, my investment firm, they're very well respected in our area. It is a local firm. And they know what I specialize in and they put me in touch with CPAs. They put me in touch with other estate planning people, but a lot of attorneys, you know, in those circles, they'll tell me. And so now if I've got an attorney I need to get in front of, I call them. I call my investment firm and say, Hey, do you know how I can get in front of this person? And most of the time they'll, they'll tell me, Hey, try going through this person to get to them. So the referral from them has been incredible. Well, I can't tell you how many millions in sales I've done just off of my own, you know, personal investment firm. I've investing with these people, but I actually make their job easier because when they're doing estate planning with CPAs, I do a ton of free BPOs for them. And when it's time to list or when things are time, my name is on all those reports and I'm the person they're calling back when it's time to sell it. That's awesome, Josh. Yep. Yeah, and Josh, I want to add too that for registered investment advisors, they're a great resource for finding seller side leads, like referrals to clients that would be selling a home. Um, they're also Absolutely. an incredibly valuable resource for finding buyers for any target acquisitions that you're not trying to purchase yourself. 
So registered investment advisors, they're right in the middle of buyers and sellers. And they love walk-ins, whereas attorneys hate walk-ins. I find that what Kat said, the investment advisors, by far the better connection to make, in my opinion, than the attorneys. What's an investment advisor? You mean just a, like a financial person, financial investment? Is that what you're talking about? Yes. And they do go through certain accreditations. Yeah. One thing about the registered investment advisor certification is they're a sworn fiduciary to their client, meaning that their client, they, they have a legal obligation to put their client's interest above their own. And so, you know, they're always looking for the credible, reputable people to refer out. Hey, Gio, do you know Bill Gross? Uh, no, I don't. Okay. He's known as the LA probate expert. And what he did is that he just went and sat in the probate court day after day after day. He just learned a ton. And he would dress like an attorney. He would look like an attorney. And you know, he started to build connections that way. Through his Thursday, 4 o'clock uh, Zoom, which goes for about an hour, he brings in some great guest speakers as well. He's making connections with people all over Southern California, all over the country, actually. And I know he's received a fair amount of referral from these people that are, are or attendee, they don't maybe have the confidence. They know he has the expertise and, you know, how he gives them a referral thing or maybe partners. I don't know, but I know he gets a ton of business out of that. So you yeah. might have to tune into that. Just look up Bill Ghost, LA probate expert, and he's a really good guy. He'd be a good guy. He'd be a great guy for anybody to talk to. And he usually is on these, these, uh, these Zooms at noon. Great. Yeah, I'll definitely check it out. Thanks. Hey, Gio, if you don't mind me asking, going back to what you said regarding the business page. It asks you your business category. What 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 would be the category there? <laughs> Not real estate, would, right? <laughs> absolutely. It's uh, services uh, under real estate, at least okay. under the Google. Yep. So you just put real estate, period? Yep. Well, for those of us who are, are realtors, are, are you referring to you you want to not uh, be known as a realtor? Well, not, not, well, I just don't want to be labeled specifically as a realtor. If I'm coming in under the umbrella of of my probate URL, integrated probate solution. You know, the one thing I've heard from Chad over the last year is, is, you know, subtly init initially, but now he just comes out and says, Hey, set up a Facebook community page on Wednesday nights, bring in all of these individuals that we've been talking about and do interviews, post videos and be, you know, that's the credibility. You know, we can, and Winston has, you know, that's a great idea to have someone build something, but. Credibility comes with content. And if the content has our, our mud in front of the camera, there's no better way for an attorney or a CPA to say, Hey, wow, Gio, he's, he's got some really good content and I can send some of my clients to, to watch his channel. And so, you know, that there's that fear factor of, oh, I don't look good. I'm speaking for myself now. Oh, I, I don't look good in front of the camera or I'm going to botch my lines. And, you know, I just got to get past that and structure it and, you know, just do a first one. And I think uh, that's a challenge challenge for, uh, I, I guess I could put out for all of us to, you know, get some content out there, even if it's just a simple YouTube uh, channel and it's, it's a start. And, you know, I'm, I'm basically calling myself out. I got to do something soon here to get my mug shot in front of folks that need my help. I want to add that to basically summarize the mechanism Geo's talking about. Google is going to look less at what you categorize yourself as and more at what content they can gather about you from your business listing. So when you set up your Google My Business, you can create a description. You can even link to different parts of your web page. You can upload videos and photos to it. You can make sure your reviews are curated there. And because you're going to tie your Google My Business account to the website that you have that matches your brand. Google understands that the content on your website describes your business. Same reason that if you have a Facebook page set up around your business, you might get a result, probably the second or third result on the Google search with your Facebook business page listed in the results. So thinking about the category might be going too deep into it. You know, keep it something simple like consulting services, something general. Um, that's really not where Google's going to make or break who to show you to. I'd like to chime in on that. Chad had recommended the book called They Ask, You Answer. I just started reading it and it's pretty interesting about content. The other publication you might want to look at is called Story Brand by Donald Miller. 
Those two will help with getting the right kind of content on your uh, website pages so that people can uh, get a clear picture of who you are. Marcus, I think his name is the writer of uh, They Asked, You Answered. He took a company in Virginia that was basically broke during the downturn of the Great Recession and turned it around. And he did, did a lot of it through digital marketing. Uh, he was answering questions that people ask, that consumers ask about a product or service. And so he said he put that foremost up front. He made comparisons of his type. They were in the pool business. Uh, he did fiberglass pools. Uh, there was concrete pool guys. And then there was also the vinyl pool folks. So he just basically made a comparison, not biased or anything, put that up. Consumers could read that. He also put up the five best pool contractors uh, in his area, and they did not include their, their own office. So just being real transparent, he gained a lot of people, and that's what it is. And in this industry, that's exactly what we have to deal with. People need to trust us. You know, they're already, you know, stressed out from, you know, the fact that, you know, somebody in their family has died, and now they got to take care of all these things. So if we can come across as more trustworthy to people, then they're going to want to work with us. And the, yeah. second, and the second book is entitled Story Brand by Donald Miller. It's kind of the same thing. You know, basically, we all need to have a story to tell, and he helps you to uh, kind of understand that. For instance, he talks about making the consumer or your client the hero. So some of the things he asks are like, you know, what does the hero want? Who or what is opposing the hero getting what she wants? What will the hero's life look like if she does or does not get what she wants? And we also have to, he has what's known as a marketing grunt test for your site. So within a few seconds, you should be able to tell those that are viewing, what do you offer? How will it make my life better? What do I need to do to, do to buy it? So those are some of the things that he outlines in his uh, book there. And because a lot of times, you know, people will look at the site and they'll click away if they don't see what they want right away. Or if presented, what you offer is not there right away in the forefront. How do you view that book and its contents related to changing or, or morphing your USP? I, I think it's important because like going back to those, those three, uh, questions there, like, what do you offer? How will it make my life better? What do I need to do to buy it? You know, that's what people are, are looking at. And if you kind of mix that also with, uh, the other book, then, you know, basically you kind of answer the question for them. So. You want them to engage with you and online is, you know, really tricky. I mean, people could have websites, but basically if you're not getting engagement, then it's, you know, what's the return? So we have to always tell a story and it's interesting because he talks about how some of these indie films are made, but they don't follow the rules. And so some people, they're, they're not as successful as in writing films, but where are these major box office movies are at. Basically those there follow a story, basically it's the hero and, and what happens to the hero, what kind of dilemma they've got. He even did it in the book. There's an outline about like Luke Walker and Star Wars. I can't remember how everything is, but I believe it's sort of early on in the book. It'll show a diagram of, you know, how he meets Obi-Wan Kenobi, you know, what the challenge was, who the villain is. He also talks about these different problems that people have. There's like a villain, there's an internal problem, there's the external problems, and there's a philosophical problem that needs to be answered. Okay. And so we become the guide. Our clients are the heroes. Thank you, Bruce. That's mm -hmm. really helpful. You're welcome. Yeah, and just put it in layman's terms. It's totally okay to speak in the first person when you do your marketing. In grade school, elementary school, they kind of hit you on the top of the head telling you not to use the word I in your academic writing. So now that we try to switch to our marketing brains and, and write messages that are either meant to be read one-on-one, -on -one, we send a, an email or a letter specifically written for one person to read, or one-to-many, meaning, you know, this email goes out to a whole list, or it's writing that exists on a web page that dozens of people could be reading. It's appropriate and beneficial to use that first-person language, right? As if you're speaking and having a conversation with the person you want to be reading it. But really just making sure you're, you're always treating your ideal prospect as a person, even if you know that it's going to be more than one person reading it. Uh, Kat, just want to get your input on, uh, if you don't mind, uh, on bomb bomb, how good is it for our, our niche? So I actually like bomb bomb and I think, you know, 
we have a few new faces on here, but if anyone's seen probably three or four of Chad's videos, they've seen his spiel on making sure you're not putting yourself at risk by sending an SMS to someone that hasn't appropriately opted in within the last 90 days. That being said, you know, make sure you're in compliance with TCPA rules, but I love bomb bomb for no other reason than it puts your face out there. You're moving. So if I'm watching a video of you, I feel like I know you already. The biggest example I can give of that, I love cooking shows on YouTube and I'll watch the same channels over and over. And I start to feel like, you know, obviously this person doesn't know me, but I'm welcomed into their kitchen one, <laughs> twice, three times a week while they're making their lasagna or replicating McDonald's chicken nuggets, but better at home. So I know these people by name. I start buying their cookbooks as gifts for people slowly, but surely I'm, I'm their fans. I'm their advocates because you know, I'm just watching their content each and every day. And I think the video and the voice, you know, video isn't just video and visual. It's also audio. It's, it's vocal. I remember your voice. I remember the way you laugh. I get to see you as another human person. That's relatable. Those, those psychological foundations, it's so much easier to accomplish that with video and audio, if you're comfortable doing that than it is in, in writing. I mean, we've all heard the joke, you know, you could send someone a text message and it could be the cheeriest, brightest, nicest message in the world, but the way that person's reading it because it's just words, they might think it comes off as rude or curt or short. Text can be a little bit more difficult to convey emotion and, and build that bridge of empathy and relatability. So I'm all for bomb bomb. It doesn't even need to be bomb bomb specifically. It's the same reason things like TikTok work, the same reason Facebook now has Instagram reels integrated on their platform. So when I say reels, I mean both platforms. It's the same reason so many realtors are just putting up goofy videos on Instagram and sharing it to Facebook. As, as a consumer, as a friend that, you know, you're, say you're into real estate, I would much rather see you post a video sharing a story or laughing and mocking the daily life of someone in real estate than I want to see another post. Hey, do you know anyone that's looking to buy or sell a house? Let me know. Creative videos, fun videos, relatable videos, they do away with that eye fatigue. The, the type of cliches that you learn to tune out and stop looking at when you keep seeing them over and over on your feed. So I would go for bomb bomb. I think their interface is, is really easy to use. Again, it comes down to you being able to record that quick video. Bomb bomb's just really the tool to help you get it out there. Thank you. If I may add one thing about bomb bomb there, it shows you instead of a leak. So the people don't feel like, well, I can't trust this because I don't even know who sent it. So it shows your face and not a leak. So that's very helpful to me anyway. And hi, I am new to this group. <laughs> Hey, welcome. And I definitely agree with that. I mean, if I see something come through to me as a text, especially from one of those, you know, they'll shorten the send from phone number to be like six digits or something like that. If I open that and it has a shortened link in it, I'm not clicking it. It could be something I just signed up from because I wanted Macy's to send me coupons, but then I get the text message and it looks suspicious because I'm not prepared for it. The literal security of being able to play that video right there rather than have to click off site to a skeptical link is another huge value factor for something like bomb bomb. All right. Do we have any other questions? Hey, Victoria. What Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Here you great. I recently got certified in probate. Um, just closed my first listing and it was a complete nightmare. <laughs> Next time I'm going to send it to a title agency and not close through the attorney's office. They gave the keys to the buyer's agent before the funds were cleared and they didn't approve the final walkthrough. They went back to the house. They were moving items out of the house. It became a liability and I was ready to trespass the agent and the buyers. The agent gave the keys to the buyers and the buyers were in the house removing items without the release of funds. I, I am also a real estate agent. Um, that was a big, uh, experience for me. What would you recommend next time? I mean, speaking retroactively, I would say to make sure you get in touch with that broker or have your broker. If you're not a broker yourself, put that on your broker's plate to communicate with their broker 
for all clients out there, that's something that, that we have to make sure that buyer's agent doesn't do that again. It could get the buyer in a lot of trouble. And it not only could it be dangerous for the seller, but even if nothing happened at all that was detrimental, the seller still would have had the right to take legal action if they wanted to, and that would harm the buyer. It would have, what a crappy way to move into your first home. So, yeah. and it's, it's as something as simple as that buyer's agent not being educated. So unfortunately, something like that, as it's happening, it's kind of when you find out that it's happening. Um, but definitely, were, were you able to have someone reach out to their their broker? I was. Um, th apparently, the estate sale company, you know, they couldn't dispose of paint cans properly and a piece of furniture. And then that became my issue once that walkthrough happened 3.30 in the afternoon on a Friday. And they wouldn't release the funds. All the papers had been signed. The attorney gave the keys to the buyer's agent and they went there and they pretty much threatened me saying if those items were not released, that they weren't going to release the funds. So I could totally be wrong on this and I'm sure someone else will jump in, but if. I think it's pretty much a universal code of contact, code of conduct, not contact, never to allow the buyer's possession until it's officially closed, whether no matter what the situation is, um, you know, I bought property, I'm in California, we use escrows, but I've used title companies and, and lawyers out, outside of the state. I, I would just make sure you have very clear communication in the future way up front so that doesn't happen again because if the, somebody wants to get hurt, they're coming up against the seller. You're the most agent, they're coming after you. What state were you in? Are you in? Florida. Florida. Um, and do you, what type of contract did you use? Did you use your state form? You're, you're a realtor? Yes. Yes. With Sotheby's and we just use our in-house listing agreement with them. And we accepted it, it. The house was just released from probate the day prior to it closing. And you had it, you had an REO addendum and everything on that. It, yes. Wow. Yeah. I, yeah. I would have taken issue immediately with that other, the other side. I have one that, um, getting them to sign a listing contract on today, but they say that we're going to have to petition the judge and, uh, it'll take at least six weeks, two to two and a half months for them to approve the sale. Is that something that I'm going to be having to attend? No, not, not typically. Not typically. Yeah, you, you shouldn't have an, they have a, they have a probate attorney, correct? Yeah. Yeah. You, that's, and everything at the moment's being, I mean, I've attended recently because I've had some nasty ones and actually a client who wanted to attend, but typically at the moment, no one's in attendance still because of COVID. The attorneys aren't attending, they're zooming in, they're taking every opportunity they can to not attend. Okay. So you know, they're not attending, so their client's not attending. I just happen to have a client who's pretty hysterical, but her attorney's not there. <laughs> She's just sitting there, and so I'm sitting with her. Uh, but no, you, you shouldn't have to attend at all. Okay. And um, I recently had my website built, and I wasn't quite sure if I had to disclose that I'm a realtor under every point of contact on there with my brokerage and the property off address of the brokerage. So your broker will be able to give you not just what your state and, and local regulations require, but also what they, as your broker, require you to have on your branding and marketing and where. Um, so I would get with your broker. A lot of the times you can put it in a really small, non-intrusive place. Yeah, because it's a franchise. There's a lot of fine lines there. Yeah. So remember the broker you work directly under should be able to guide you on this. At minimum, this is something they should be able to answer your questions on. If not, I would look at an example website of a peer that's been in the office for a while. Okay. All right. I have a, a question or a couple questions, and these are for Victoria or for anyone. Is that normal to have a REO addendum with a probate house? Absolutely. It, it used to be in California, one of our car addendums. They're using it all the time, but they've actually incorporated it into our contract. 
Uh -huh. We don't even have to go pull it anymore. It's in our standard contract. It's great. I'm happy to send it. If it's not one you can pull from your platform, of course, you can just go look quickly because it'll be easy to find under R in your hundreds of forms. But if it's not something there for you, I would strongly suggest to get ours and, and make it one. Okay. I'm in Ohio, so I don't even know. I, I don't have a deal or anything, but I was wondering uh, about this addendum because I thought we just used, you know, regular paperwork. You do, but go see if there's one. If you haven't worked in it, it just, you don't know what you don't know. I, I didn't That's know true. there, I didn't know there was one. <laughs> okay. That's good. Okay. And about this attorney that, that was, that gave the keys, <clears throat> excuse me, was, he was not a real estate attorney, obviously. He was just the attorney for, for who? What, what, for the, uh, probate, pro estate planning probate. attorney. Oh, yeah. oh, geez. He didn't know what he was doing. I would use a title company. <laughs> Never use that. Okay. It sounds like that permit attorney needs to bring all of their real estate needs to you next time, Victoria. <laughs> Tell them. <laughs> yeah. He owes you some business because he messed up. Sure. All right. And my, and my last question is how are you getting your deals, your uh, people? What are you doing to get business? That's what I do. I used to do personal property appraisals. And mm -hmm. I did uh, estate liquidations years ago, and I work closely with estate sale companies mm -hmm. and appraisers. They'll use me to go in and do valuations. Mm -hmm. And then I pimp my kids out to them to work the sales. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's pretty good. Pimp them out. All right. And my last question is, so you got a probate website from all the leads. I, d I do. It's like a vanity website. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you so much. Ran from questions. Okay, guys, I have a question. And this goes to all the people that already have experience, people experience in Florida, been a realtor for almost 20 years in the area. Question on a case that the, someone died, it did not go through probate. It's been literally two years and the property is going through a uh, pre foreclosure with a reverse mortgage, which I'm going to contact the guy from the reverse mortgage. My question to you is on your own experience. I don't know if someone had to deal with a situation like this. What will be the first step? I'm trying to get a bunch of children together, but more than that, I would like to know if this is something that for instance, the personal representative of the deceased, deceased party or deceased party, she's willing to basically do things on her own as soon as possible to take care of the probate. So anyone out there? Is there a will? I think uh, you got to petition the court with all the heirs who are getting in as a personal rapper. Great opportunity to get connected with a probate attorney because you've probably got a lead to bring him right off the bat. Okay. Well, fair enough. Thank you guys. I think you're going to do an emergency petition with the courts to stop the pre foreclosure. Just to let you know. Thank you. All right. We've got a few minutes left. Does anybody have anything else before we wrap up? Yeah, I do actually, you guys, I'm new to the group. I've been kind of hanging in the background the past few weeks and just watching, listening and absorbing and whatnot. And I started doing direct mails and I've, I've actually got a VA cause I have a ton of leads that I'm going through that are about a year out and I'm getting calls back and I have people who are in like Pinellas County that have, you know, a home that's, it's worth a lot of money and they also need another home. I'm a realtor as well, but I'm really, really new to the real estate side down here. I was in Michigan and I just, you know, I guess I'm looking for some sort of advice on the phone call that I'm going to make to this gentleman. Cause the home is actually, it's worth 1.3 and he's, he's like, I want to sell and he needs to downsize and I don't want to lose that deal. What would be the best advice that anyone could give me moving into, you know, that kind of market? Cause I don't, I don't do those larger sales. What would be the best approach for something like that in my return call to him this afternoon? Is the mortgage paid? Yes, it is. Okay. Is he willing to go to a breach loan? Now that I don't know, cause I'm actually just making my initial contact with him this afternoon. Hmm. Well, I guess if I'm a direct call that a VA made to him. Okay. Well, 
you know, a lot of things, you know, obviously we can offer them different options, right? We can go cash, cash retail, list it. I've got a lot of cash buyers here that, you know, come down obviously from like New York and whatnot, and they have, they've got cash in hands. Well, if he's downsizing, because basically what you can do is right now, you need to find him a place. Yes. Yes. That will be, first. that will be the first step, find him a place. And that's pretty much it. How good is his credit? Um, okay. how much? No, it's like, it's a hundred percent equity, right? Yeah. I believe this one is. Oh, maybe. Oh, yes. A home equity. And okay. Then, okay. Yeah. So like a home equity. Yeah. Half okay. the interest. Yep. What was that on the interest? Half the interest. Yep. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, the biggest thing with the home equity line is that it's going to be a lot faster and a lot less paperwork. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Great input, you guys. So, um, all right. Does anybody work at Pinellas area that knows anyone who might be like rehabbing a home that they want to sell? <laughs> I know a mortgage guy in that area. Yeah. Rebel here says he's in the area. Okay. Yeah. If you guys have anything, let me know and I can, I can drop my, my email or phone number or whatnot. And I do want to make a comment to the people who are really afraid of, of doing videos and whatnot. You know, it is very nerve wracking, but I want to suggest to you guys, if you prepare something and you've got it written out, I can recommend an app called Big View, B-I-G-V-U. You can actually cut copy paste into that. And you can literally, as you're holding your phone up like this, you can read from it and it doesn't look like you're reading anything. So you don't have to worry about forgetting what you're saying and the points that you want to make. So I take my blogs and I read them, you know, and I'm starting to send those out and post them on Facebook and whatnot. So just a suggestion, but yeah, thanks you guys. Great information on that. Um, and I'll recommend that. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Thank you, Melanie. I see in the chat that Kim had asked if you could share your contact information, if you're open to that. I will drop that now. Thanks guys. All right. Awesome. Well, I just want to thank all of you for um, bearing with us with the unexpectedness of Chad not being here today. I'm super impressed with the involvement and the way that everyone just kind of chimed in and gave their thoughts. I thought this was a very successful group call. And next week, Chad should be here to help answer any other questions that you may have. All right. Thank you guys so much for sticking around. I hope you have a great rest of your week and until next time. All right. See ya. Bye. Bye.